Hey everybody, it's me, Sheesh. And before we begin, I just want to give a quick thank you to everybody listening, watching, and supporting the podcast. It means the world to us, and we're so appreciative. I just want to let you guys know that you guys can always ask us questions, give us segment ideas, and keep up with the fun, all at ashishandfriends.com. We're on Twitter at ashishandpals, we're on Instagram at ashishandfriends, and hey, we're even on Facebook, facebook.com slash ashishandfriendspod. If you're watching this video, please go ahead and give it a like and subscribe to the channel. All that following and liking and subscribing will help us grow and keep going, so we appreciate it so much. And once again, thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Ah, uh, yes. Welcome to the another episode of the Sheesh and Friends podcast. With voting season on the horizon, we thought it'd be a great opportunity to, to discuss uh, ways to register in case you don't know that. And, uh, you know, some voting, voting questions you may have that we've had in the group as well. And we just want to, you know, um, talk about those. And, and we'll end off by talking about why it's so important to vote. As always, I'm your host, Ashish. You can catch me on Instagram and on Twitter, at Ashish Airy. Obviously, I'm joined by my longtime friends and co-hosts. We've got Shahan at Shahan Jayaraja. We've got Dev at Superlaser. And we've got Ryan. We're going to start this episode talking about someone that just passed away last week and uh, played such an important role um, in her lifetime. And that is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm going to toss it around so we can all talk about her. But this is someone that's so important, uh, someone that fought so hard for um gender equality and and did so many things I'll, I'll talk about our background a little bit later on but ryan let's get started like what did rbg uh, mean to you and uh, why is she so important i'm just gonna keep this short but i think what she did in her life aligned with what she fought for and i think it's a beautiful thing because she was the second a uh, woman as a supreme justice and she fought for gender equality I think that alignment and her life values, you can tell what she fought for. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think that's what she would want to be remembered by. Yeah. So when I think of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I think of a few things, right? And and um, I didn't know uh, her that well, or like I'm not that into like the minutia of the Supreme Court operating. But these are just some things I knew about her, and I did watch a little video talk, talking about her life uh, because I was interested. Uh, so the first thing, obviously, best nickname out there, the Notorious RBG, amazing nickname. Um, she was also one of only nine women in her law school class, which I think was incredible. Uh, on top of that, she was raising a baby while in law school and got... Um, tied for like first in her class or whatever. I assume she probably had like a perfect GPA and she was tied for first or whatever. And uh, she also didn't get a single job offer, uh, apparently due to the fact that she had a kid and a law firm didn't want to take a risk on someone who had a kid. Um, she also argued six gender discrimination cases at the Supreme Court before becoming a judge. Uh, and this was in the 70s, I believe. And then she became a judge in 1993. And one of the like other really inspiring things that I loved about her was the fact that um, even though she came down with cancer, she scheduled all of her chemo around her obligations as a Supreme Court justice. So she didn't miss a single day, which I, I think is like truly incredible. I mean, imagine being that sick and being so committed to your job that you don't want to miss a single day like that's that's crazy yeah and so first of all if you haven't watched the movie on the basis of sex it's it's a fantastic movie it talks a lot about kind of her early personal life especially and you know one thing that that, that you didn't mention so she was actually told by the dean of law at harvard she was basically asked like why are you here why are you taking a spot from a man and and actually, so her husband, when she was when they were both in law school, because they were both in law school yeah. at the time, not only did she do her classes, she actually went to all of her husband's classes and took mm -hmm. notes in all of his classes and then went home and like talked to him, basically. So because he was sick, right? Right. Because he was classes. sick and couldn't go mm -hmm. to class. And yeah. And after all of that, like you said, finished number one in her class, graduated, didn't get a single job offer. And, and one thing that I, I want people to, to try and understand 
is that I know that when we hear things like that and when we hear stories like that, it seems like it was so long ago, right? When we hear these cases of, like, Jim Crow, when we hear these cases of gender discrimination, we think that it's such a long time ago. But, you know, I mean, she is younger than than my grandma was, right? Like, you know, who still was alive, who, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. And she she played such a big role in the advancement of gender equality. And she also had significant rulings in cases that involved racial disparity as well. Um, mm-hmm. You know, she kind of became best known because she was one of the uh, the key lawyers for the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, um, which if you look back at the history of this country has been at the forefront of so many of, of the great changes that have ever happened in this country. Um, and, and yeah, so, I mean, I think that, I think that it's easy sometimes to, you know, to, to look at maybe the most recent things that have happened, but you're, you're talking back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, her uh, fighting cases on gender discrimination. We're talking, um, you know, the rights to own, you know, for women to own property, the rights for women to sign their own leases, the rights for, you know, uh, power of attorney, stuff like that. Like, this is stuff that was groundbreaking at the time. So, I mean, look, I, I think that in general, I think that sometimes, especially now, you know, in, in this current world, sometimes we have the, uh, you know, sometimes we like to to sort of tear people down sometimes, I guess, is the big thing that I'd say. But you look at sort of her entire legacy, then obviously being a Supreme Court justice and being one of the most fervent advocates for justice throughout her entire time there. Um, you know, I, I think that really, you know, she deserves all the credit that she's getting. She deserves all the, the accolades that she's getting. And, and I think that. <laughs> I think that's it, her loss to the court. I mean, obviously at this time, but just in general too, is, is just a tremendous loss. Right. And, and I know that one of the things that she fought for so hard was voter rights. And so it's just really, really appropriate that she's part of this episode. And one of her, like one of the quotes that <clears throat> I had heard by her that just like always stuck by me is that um, she mentions that in the constitution, it says we the people and one thing that was like so beautiful about the constitution is that for 200 years we've been fighting to expand that definition of of we right and, and as someone who who always um fights for like human human rights over anything else like that's awe inspiring to me yeah no for sure so something shahan mentioned like sometimes we think about oh you know this is like in the 1960s and 70s when she was doing you know becoming a professor and all these things i think that just makes it like you have to think about how harder how much harder it was at those times right like even now we're fighting for uh you know women's rights and and gender equality like at that time like doing what she's what she was doing is just incredible right like if you want to talk about someone that made the most of their time i think you she, obviously Ruth Bader Ginsburg has to be up there because she did so many amazing things. If you just look at her academic career as uh, Dev touched on, you know, going to uh, Cornell, right. Then getting her going to Harvard law as Shahan mentioned, and then transferring to Columbia law, right. Like she did so much back then. Uh, then going, uh, becoming professor. Uh, she was like, I think one of 20 law professors that were females in the, in the, uh, in the U S at the time, which is incredible. And, um, uh, she even wrote um, for a project at Columbia. Uh, she learned Swedish for it. And actually, that's like one thing that inspired her too, was that she found out like 20 to 25% uh, of the law students there were actually female. Whereas over here, obviously, she, as uh, Sean mentioned on um, and, and Dev, that she was just one of a few in, in like 500 men, right? And, you know, if you just want to talk to her uh, about her, like she's just such an incredible person. Like, you talk about someone facing adversity at a young age. She lost her mother uh, right before high school graduation, you know, and still ended up doing such amazing things. So I, I think there's just so many lessons you can, you know, talk about when you talk about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah, and, and and so you know, one thing too, right? You know, sometimes we have the conversation now about like equal pay. We have the conversation about you know just the ways that that women you know, aren't necessarily as, uh, you know, in, in the positions where they should be, right, where they reach a glass ceiling, all this sort of stuff. The idea of gender discrimination didn't really exist before Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And, you know, that was one of the things that she fought to the Supreme Court was that women should have their rights protected, right? Because, like, for example, I mean, back in the day, it was totally legal for you to be fired for being pregnant. It was totally legal to not hire you because you were pregnant or because you're a woman and they, they were worried you might get pregnant, right? All of this stuff was 100% legal at the time. And the idea of saying, 
well, we shouldn't just punish a woman because she got pregnant literally did not exist until uh, the ACLU and Ruth Bader Ginsburg came forward. Yeah, and one of those, um, one of the things that I really loved about her is the fact that she would fight for women's rights through, uh, through like men's rights. And I think that's so cool because a lot of times when people talk about feminism, they think about this like women over men, this like myth that feminism is that when it's really about equality. And there are places in, in the current system where men get shafted and there are places in the current system where women get shafted. And she fought for both of them. And that's what's truly inspiring. Yeah. So obviously she lived a legendary life. And obviously I think the best thing to do is obviously we're all inspired by her, right? The best thing we can do is, well, you know, kind of keep the talks going and do our part by talking about it, taking action and uh, try to try to live as legendary as a life as she did. So rest in peace and rest in powers to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We're going to move along and talk about you know, registration questions and, and voting questions that we may have. This actually just happened a couple of days ago. Ryan had a bunch of questions, was blowing up my phone in the group uh, chat and was just asking Shahan, like, hey, Shahan, how do I do all this, all this? So, you know, you know, he, he still hasn't acted on it, and that's not what we want you to do. So please take this information, spread it, and, and take action. So, Ryan. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll jump in first, actually. So first of all, something to know, uh, I believe that today, Tuesday, is um, is voter right or voter registration day in America, right? So this is something that, um, you know, every single day in America should be, you know, voter rights uh, <laughs> or voter registration day. But but today, especially when we're recording the episode, and, you know, by the time that you're listening to it, just assume that it's, still, you know, pretend that it's still voter registration day. And, um, you know, so so something just really quick to know. Uh, the last day to register in the state of Texas, which I imagine that most of the people in the state of Texas uh, or who listen are in the state of Texas, the last day to register is October 5th. Don't wait until that day because you have to know that it'll get postmarked by that day. You have to know that it's going to get there, obviously, in a timely fashion. Don't wait to do it. Do it as soon as you hear this episode. And, uh, you know, we can get into a little bit more uh, later about why it's so important to register and to vote. But uh, go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is the uh, part of the episode where we just have a Q&A with Ryan asking the questions, and we'll jump in and answer. My first question is, how do you register to vote? Can you do that online? Yeah, so, and we're going to, most of the answers that I'm going to give are going to be more specific to Texas. There are different procedures. It's going to be similar. And the other thing that I'll say is that it is harder here than most other places for reasons that are pretty much rooted in racism. But that's a whole other thing that we can get to later. Um, so the way that you do it, okay, so you can register online, but it doesn't go all the way through online. You have to go and, and fill out a form online. But then you have to print it and physically mail it uh, to the voter registrar's office in order to get it approved. Um, again, the only reason that this step exists is to make life harder and to try to prevent people from voting. That That's the only reason that this rule exists. But you do have to do it that way. The other way that you can do it is you can go to a post office or a library or most other government buildings, and they should have voter registration applications, right? So you go there, they'll hand it to you, um, and you can actually kind of fill it out and all the information is pretty basic. Uh, you know, one thing to know is that they'll ask for a driver's license or, or an ID in the state of Texas. Again, this is not something that exists everywhere, but especially in the state of Texas, you need a voter ID to vote. Again, another rule that only exists to try to keep black people from voting. That's the only reason it exists. And so, um, but, but what you have to do, if you don't have a driver's license specifically, you can use, uh, you can use a state ID card, which is something that some people have. You can use a concealed carry <laughs> permit. Of course you can. Um, a passport? Does have to, yes, a passport is another thing. Yes, that you can definitely use. Um, you cannot use like a social security card. It has to be a photo government ID. Now, we can get into the whole thing about, wait, what about college IDs that are, you know, from state schools? Guess what? They don't count. That, that doesn't count because, again, bad reasons. But, um, but you do need a voter ID to be able to vote. You're going to need to bring it with you to the polls whenever you do go vote. But basically, all you have to do is you go and fill out that form and you go and mail it to the address that will be right there on the form. Um, and, and actually, with the, with the forms that you pick up from the library or from a, a government building, you actually don't even need postage. You can just stick it right in the mail and it will go right to the state office and you will be registered to vote. Uh, on that form, is there any pieces of information what pieces of information would I need to fill that format completely? 
Yeah, actually, I, I actually have some forms back here. So if you can vamp for a second, I can go grab them. Yeah, so one thing you can do is um, just make sure you're registered to vote, right? That's a question some people have. Like, you, you know, you've voted in the past. Are you still registered to vote? It's as easy as just Googling, am I registered to vote? Put in your state, county, whatever. And you'll get a website and you can check yeah. and see vote. if you're actually already registered to vote. Vote.org is the website. Yeah. So this is, uh, I, I don't know how many people are, are watching on the, on the video versus listening to the podcast, but this is what it looks like, right? And on this side, there's another side where you can, again, just stick it in the mail and vote. So what you're going to do, the, these questions are very easy, okay? So there's 10 different sections on it. All of them are pretty basic. Section one, uh, these questions, uh, so is it a new application? If it's a new application, then you check that box. Are you a citizen? Will you be 18 before election day? You must be both of those things. You have to be a U.S. citizen. If you have a green card, you're not eligible to vote. If you have uh, you know, permanent residency, not eligible to vote. You have to be a citizen in order to vote. And you have to be 18 years. The other thing, too, though, is that if you will be 18 before election day, even if you're not yet 18, you are still eligible to register to vote. And it has to be done before October 5th. So next up. And the, the election name, day is November 3rd for any 18-year-olds yes. listening or 17-year-olds. Yes. yes, and we'll definitely get to that uh, closer to the end, too. Um, so it's last name, first name, middle name, former name, if any, residence address. So all that's pretty basic. Uh, city and county of, of uh, former residence, all, all that stuff. Date of birth, gender, telephone number. And so then this is section nine is when you kind of uh, have to have a driver's license or a state ID or something like that. And again, if you don't, like, it sucks, obviously. That like, there's nothing you can uh, unfortunately do at that point. It's only meant to make things harder. That's the only reason it exists. Um, but but most Texans do have driver's licenses, obviously, just because of how much you need to drive in Texas. So if you're listening and have a driver's license, you put that number down. Um, actually, you can actually put the last four digits of your social security number, but you will need to find some other form of uh, voter ID to be able to go and vote. They need to identify you that way. Um, and then you sign it at the bottom and it just asks, are you a resident? Are you not a felon? If you are a felon in the state of Texas, you are ineligible to vote. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on that, um, <laughs> but we won't get into that right now. But you are not in the state of Texas at least eligible to vote. If you are in other places, certain other places do give you the right to vote, like uh, if you've completed your sentence and stuff like that. So check your state. It might be different based on the state, but um, in Texas you are not. And uh, the, and then it just says, and you have not been determined by a court to be mentally incapacitated. So it's very easy. It's a very easy form to fill out. Just 10 spots on here, all very basic questions to answer. And again, so if you uh, if you see there's an address on the back, you can just stick this right in the mail and it'll go uh, straight to that address and you'll be registered to vote. Now, one thing to note, too, is that if you do that, right, if you send it off you know, around October 5th, early voting does start before November 3rd. And so you are eligible to vote at that time, but they might tell you because you're not as yet officially registered to vote, they might tell you that you need to fill out a provisional ballot instead. So all that means is that they'll put you down as sort of one that they need to double check once you hit election day, but you still are eligible to do that. And so you'll fill out your ballot on election day, they'll compare it to make sure that your form has in fact gone through and your vote will still count. Okay, so now that I've filled this out and I sent it, do you know what the typical turnaround time is to get that registration? And we mentioned it while you were gone, but from what I understand, you know if you're registered by going to the website and checking your status. Yeah, and so, um, and actually, I believe that there's a Texas specific site that's votetexas.org as well. So you can actually go to that site. And if you are, if you are pretty sure that you're registered to vote, still go and check that site. Okay. Every so often, they'll turn over their voter rolls. They'll, they'll try to to kick you off, basically. Um, again, the only I, I don't even think I need to say that you guys get it. But um, but uh, so just go and check just to make sure. Don't wait until after uh, October fifth to do that. And and just a tip if you're going to check, make sure if if it comes up that you're not registered, check and alternate or old address so for me even though i got my driver's license changed even though i checked the box saying please register me to vote they didn't change my voter registration so i had to do that and move it to my current address yes. so if so also check you might be registered at your old address accidentally so fix that if, yeah. if you need and, to and you do need to get that changed before yeah. 
election day. They, you are not allowed to vote at your old address. You've got to vote where you live right now. So, um, and, and what was the question again, Ryan? Wait, is that, ad, well, I have a side question. Is that address based on the address on the ID you're pressing or the address you write down on your form? So it would be, it would be based on what you have written down on your form. Um, so again, I mean, I know that some people have like PO boxes. Um, you know, you really want to try to register at your street address uh, and typically, you know, where you have uh, on the ID as well, because they are going to potentially try and match you to, to that address. Um, and, and the other thing that you asked was turnaround time. It can take um, anywhere from two to four weeks for this to get turned around. But that's why, again, if you do register before October 5th and you do want to go vote early, you are 100% eligible to do that, even if the, your voter registration hasn't gone through, okay? So um, so as soon as you turn in that form, you are eligible to go and vote for this upcoming election. Okay, so now I have my voter registration as all fine and dandy. What are all the things I can vote for? Because I typically think I can vote for the president, but I know there's a lot of other things that you're eligible to vote for and you should vote for. So, what's no, that's mean? that's not true. There's literally only one vote. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, that that's actually a great question. And so this is actually there, there's a great resource actually called Ballotopedia. Okay, so um, if you're not exactly sure who you're voting for, I mean, like for me for the primary, like that was a big thing for me was that you know. I'm pretty politically knowledgeable. I, I mean, I'm not I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know every judge primary. OK, I just don't. Right. So so basically the deal is any elected official that that's up will be on your ballot based on uh, where you put down as your address. So, so, for example, I'm in Dallas County. I live in the city of Irving. I'm at whatever precinct. Right. So I'm eligible to vote for all the things that impact that one area. So what that means is you're allowed to vote for anything. And so for Ryan, for example, you're in Bell County, I think that we talked about, you know, you're in the city of Temple. Anything that is within this, that area, you're eligible to vote for all of it. You're eligible to vote for city councilmen. You're able to vote for school board members. You're able to vote for, uh, obviously, co uh, congressman, president, senator. Uh, you're able to vote for so, statewide officials in Texas. So, like, you're going to have a pretty long ballot, especially when it comes to November. So you guys should be able to see my screen here in a sec. And uh, yeah, so all I did was I went to Ballotopedia. I'll start over again. And I just clicked this where what's on your ballot button and it pulls this up. I just filled in all of my info um, and I click view my ballot. And here you go. Here's your ballot. You can see everything that you can vote on. So the first one is uh, district. Obviously, here's all the people who are running. Then you have president, Senate, Railroad Commission. I mean, Look at look at how many things you can vote on. Supreme right. Court judges, court criminals, and uh, I believe that you can click on these people and actually learn about mm -hmm. their policies and like what their their plans are. So yeah, and I, I, will I do say, this before I every say. election, and I think yeah. it's just a great way to learn. Yeah, for sure. And and they, you know, so some candidates on Ballotopedia do sort of give like a questionnaire where where they can uh, kind of tell you some of the issues. With some of them, I mean, you just got to you can go to their website every candidate has a website all of them have an issues page on their website um and and you can learn a lot about them really quickly and and ultimately yeah i mean when you're when you're going to vote it's like look nobody expects you to know every single individual person and break down every single one of their policies i mean that's kind of the whole reason that we do have political parties is you know is to try to make a differentiation even if you don't know but this is a great way to learn whether there's somebody that you would be motivated to vote for to learn hey maybe this person i'm not motivated to vote for um you know this person i want to protest i you know it just depends right it just depends on what you got going on yeah, for sure. This is a great tool. I actually had no idea about this. So thanks for telling us about this, Shahan. Uh, Dev, I think we get the picture if you want to stop sharing your screen here. <laughs> yeah, well, I just wanted to talk about, you know, share share a little bit of a very important, uh, yeah, just, but a very I mean, important uh, election that we're seeing. So, But no, it's yeah. a very good thing. It's a very good thing because, you know, something I felt, uh, you know, when I first started voting, 
you get a little confused when there's so many you know options with so many things. You're like, what? I thought I was just voting for the president, right? Like something Ryan mentioned, and you're like, no, you're voting for all these things. You have the option, so it's good to read up on them and be aware and know what you're going for before you head into that thing because it gets confusing. The first time I voted, I was just like, what, what is this? Like, who are these people? I don't even know what I'm doing here. But uh, that's something you definitely want to do beforehand. Yeah, and and that's one of the things too, right? Is like you might go in and only expect like, oh, you know, there's only two political parties. There's Republican and Democrat. Well, no, there's so many political parties, right? You know, there's Libertarian, there's Green Party, there's Constitution Party. I mean, there's just all these these uh, things that are going to be running. And look, and, and so part of that is, you know, we always hear there's only two parties. Well, I mean, the reality is you have a lot of options. And one thing, too, and this is more heading forward, is that, you know, so I, I definitely heard a lot in 2016 that like, oh, uh, you know, I wasn't happy with these options. Well, we have a process to select these options, right? They're called primaries. And, you know, that's when when you vote earlier in the year, that's how you pick who's going to be on this ballot in November. Don't just show up in November and and think that, you know, everything's going to be exactly what you want. Because, like, I hear so much like, oh, uh, you know, I, I'm just not excited about this person. It's like most of us aren't, you know, like regardless on the race, right? Like it's 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 unusual to have a candidate that everybody's excited about. But, you know, we have a process to choose these people. And sometimes that means making compromises. Sometimes that means, you know, uh, voting what you think is is best, even if it's not what you're most excited about. Like, again, I'm, I'm obviously going to be there in November. And there's only, you know, a handful of candidates that I'm like, I physically want to go out and campaign for these people. I physically want to, you know, it, and that's just part of this process, right? And I know that that doesn't feel good. I know that doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound as exciting as like when we were back in school in 2008 and everybody got to be all excited about Obama. But like, that's a very unusual election. That's just not usually how it is. Yeah. I appreciate that you showed that website because that was going to be my next question. We have so many options and so many different categories to vote for, but I want to make an informed decision on not just a decision about what the media is portrayed or what I hear. And so given that we have Ballotpedia, are there any other resources anybody has that can be used to learn their websites, their personal websites? Probably yeah. could be. But yeah, that- well, so so for me, um, you know, we live in Dallas County, or th- three of the four of us live in Dallas County. And I'll tell you what, the best resource that comes up every single year is the Dallas Morning News Creates a Voter Guide. And in it, they have questionnaires with all the candidates they'll go through. I mean, it, it's tremendously informative, especially, again, for me during the primary process, right? Because, like, you know, you're going through and trying to figure out who all these people are, um, you, you know, but it's tremendously useful. They, they'll have questionnaires with everybody. Uh, some newspapers will also do endorsements and stuff. Now, don't take the endorsement to mean that, like, this is who you should or have to vote for. But it's just a way to kind of hear, okay, this was the pros of this one candidate and maybe some of the cons of some of these candidates. And so um, really just newspapers and in general are, are tremendous resources for trying to learn more about, especially some of the candidates who aren't the president, who aren't the Senate race, all that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, their websites are incredibly robust. I mean, especially obviously at the higher levels, but even at the lower levels, they, they'll talk a lot about what they've done, what makes them qualified for the job, um, you know, and and so you can go through almost every one of their websites. You know, they want their websites to be a resource to learn more about them and what they stand for. So that's easily one of the best ways that you can do that. Yeah, yeah and Balladopedia does have a link directly to the website from, from there. So you can click or, you know, there's this resource called Google, sometimes useful. And Wikipedia, but that's another. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's Wikipedia is great for getting a base level knowledge on things. So now that we have our voter registration and we're informed by we're informed of all the categories and all the possible options that we have, what is the process of actually voting? Going to the voting booth, or do you have to go to the voting booth? Can you vote online? Yeah, that that's a great question. So. One thing to note, right? So November 3rd is election day. You actually have a lot longer to actually vote, right? And so early voting in the state of Texas actually starts on October 13th. So you get a lot of time in advance so that, you know, look, this is a dangerous time. This is, you know, a time that all of us are not trying to to stand around in line with, you know, a thousand of our closest friends at this very moment. So if you go early, you'll, you'll actually be able to go into a lot of these polling places and be able to, to get in and out very quickly, right? And so, um, but the actual process of it, right? So when you go in, first of all, 
I don't care how big a fan you are of, of any of your candidates. You should not wear anything uh, tied to a political candidate or a political party into the thing. They will, in some cases, they will turn you away. It's technically not allowed to do that. So I don't, look, you can be the most excited person about Joe Biden or, or Donald Trump or, you know, Joe Jorgensen of all time, but don't wear their gear to the polling place. It's not allowed. So what you'll do, right? You go to the, the polling place, figure, uh, first of all, actually, you know, one, yeah. That's exactly my question. Where exactly can you go uh, t to vote? Yeah, and so that's that's another great question. So, um, you know, one thing is whenever you uh, whenever you go to that online resource, if you are already registered to vote, if they already have you showing up, they'll actually tell you what your precinct is, right? But one thing to note too, and this is dependent on county, this is dependent on state. So, look it up. Look up what exactly it means in your state. Um, but I know in Dallas County and in Bell County, where all of us live, uh, you are eligible to vote at any precinct. You don't have to go to one specific one to vote. You can actually go <clears throat> to any precinct in your county. Now, it does have to be in your county, right? Like, I can't go to Tarrant County to vote. I can't go to Denton County to vote. I have to vote in Dallas County. But I can go to any uh, precinct in Dallas County. And there's a list of precincts that are open on your county's website. And and they'll, first of all, talk about ones that are open on election day, but there's another list that's gonna be shorter because they don't have all of them open the entire time. There's gonna be a shorter list of ones that are open during early voting. So look at that list, figure out which one makes sense for you. Uh, check the hours of it too. That should all be on the website. Um, and then, but, so once you do, yeah. First of all, what do you mean by precinct? And second of all, for early voting, voting, do you have to register to be in the early voting or can anybody with the voter registrations go to early voting? Anybody who's registered to vote can early vote. Uh, it's exactly the same as as going and voting on election day. You just have more opportunity opportunities to do it. And it's, precincts, it's literally just there so you don't have to stand in as long of a line. That's exactly. the only purpose it serves. I, I have not voted <laughs> on election day in a great many years. Most people do, but, but it's so much easier to not. And so a precinct, you know, that's... It's a basically a fancy a fancy word for voting site, right? That's all it is. You know, when whenever you go, you just go to the precinct to vote. And what it's I think actually based on is that like, you know, especially when they didn't have what's called uh, open elections in terms of that you could go to any site. Um, you know, it would be like okay, you live in this uh, particular square of land, and those people are all part of this precinct. So actually, in many cases, uh, you know political parties and stuff like that will do things specific to certain precincts to try to micro target groups of voters. But, you know, now all it really means to you is that you have to go to that voting site and, and you can go and vote. And so, you know, when, when you are preparing to get a vote, you got to have your voter ID, right? So you got to have your driver's license, you got to have your passport, whatever it is, have a copy of that, bring it with you to the voter registration site. Again, don't wear anything politi uh, political, political, uh, you'll stand in line, you know, hopefully, you know, we're, we're all praying to God that they're going to have this set up pretty well. And and when I did vote in the primaries and, and the runoffs, they did handle things pretty well in terms of safety. They, they did. So, um, you know, hopefully they'll be able to, to keep that going. Um, but so you'll go to the site, you'll stand in line. Eventually, you'll kind of reach a table. They'll check all your information. They'll check your voter ID, uh, make sure that all the information looks good. And then they'll give you sort of like a they'll they'll give you kind of it depends on the the voting precinct because sometimes they do voting different ways but one way or another they'll give you what you need to vote you go to an actual like booth right it's like an actual voting booth again some of them are digital some of them are not it just depends on where you are they'll cast your vote they'll go through all of the options and eventually you'll either put it in a ballot box or submit it electronically it just depends um i think that most uh most areas where you vote now do have a physical paper just as like a backup and then they'll submit it through like a scanner um they'll, they'll submit like your results electronically first but then they also have the physical ballots so that they have a backup just to, you know just try to prevent uh, election fraud and all that sort of, uh, all that sort of thing and um and yeah and then you're done you get your i voted sticker and, and you can leave yeah, and you can put that I voted sticker on your laptop. You can put it on your shirt. You can ship it to someone. You can, you can mail put it, it around. Instagram. Yeah, yeah, you can put it on Instagram. Exactly. Yeah, tag, if you if you do go vote, tag Adishish and friends on Instagram. We'd love to see the photos of you voting. So and and know, we'll repost we it. it on our story and and we'll give you a shout out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you have to do it for the Instagram, right? Uh, but but this is so informational. Uh, really appreciate this, Shahan. Um, obviously, like.
I vote. I, I kind of know the basics of like getting registered and everything. But I learned so much just with Shahan talking about so many things, like things I, I was unaware of, like, you know, a lot of sources out here. So this is very informational. I hope, you know, hopefully you guys learned something. But this is something you can always spread around, right? Like one of the easiest things to do and things we want to push is like, tell people to get registered, right? Like hit up yeah. your family hit up your friends. It's as easy as putting something on Instagram, right? Like today's oh, National Voter uh, voter Registration Day. Just put that out there. Tell people to like, get registered, check, make sure they're registered and, and, you know, spread the word. Yeah. And so one thing that I'll say, right, is that I think that one group, and, and this is obviously very relevant to us, one of the most underrepresented groups in the electoral, uh, you know, in elections, basically, are South Asians. Is South Asians don't really vote. They're not really engaged. You know, I know that there are certainly instances where, like, you know, so, there are a lot of uh, South Asians who are kind of just like, I'm not going to cause trouble. I'm not going to, you know, do anything. And there's a lot of people who prefer to kind of be more engaged with with uh, Indian politics, even sometimes, than than American politics. But look, I hear a lot, and and I mean, look, I, I don't think that it's any secret to the people listening that you know, most of us here have, and especially me, and you know, I, I have progressive leanings right like i don't think that's a secret but you know what i'll say right is that we have an opportunity here to take what's been happening in the world around us and do something about it right if you're not happy with the way things are if you think that things should be different if you if you're unhappy with what's happening around you this is when you can hold people accountable, right? This is your moment to be able to hold people accountable. We can say all this stuff, you know, and, and protesting is very good and, and all this sort of stuff, but like, this is their, this is where you get to choose whether they have a job again or not. And so for me, one of the things that I've been trying to do, and, and I'm part of a, actually an organization that caters specifically to South Asian voters, right? That, that's a big thing about what we do. I have been, uh, I, I've been kind of trying to go and, actually reach out to individual people and be like, are you registered to vote? And because, you know, I, I think that it's great to post something on Instagram or on Facebook. And I've had people tell me that they remembered to vote because of that, right? That's great. You should do that. But, you know, one thing that you realize too is that you should not only do something more broad, but like go and talk to individual people. Go and talk to your your family, right? Like your older family who especially, you know, I mean, I don't want to say only talk to them if they'll vote like you, but, you know, especially if they will vote like you, you know, make sure that your parents are registered. Make sure that your siblings are registered. Make sure that your cousins are registered. Make sure that your aunts and uncles are registered. Um, you know, we're, we're actually trying a thing where we're trying to each, you know, every member of this group that I'm in, we're trying to individually say, who are 25 people that we know that we can try to get to the polls. And like, that sounds like a lot of people, but once you talk to your family and you're like, okay, well, you know, my aunt's family has six people, well, that's six, right? Like all of it adds up so quickly. And and the thing is too, right? Like nobody's more connected in the South Asian community than other South Asians, right? And so the best way to get this sort of thing done is to do it yourself. And yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes people will be like, no, I don't want to, or no, I'm not interested, but like, if you reach out and you talk individually and specifically to certain people, that's going to be the best way that they're going to know that, you know, it's not just a broad thing. It's not that this is just for other people. Like, we want you specifically to vote. Well, and that kind of ties right into the last question that we had. Uh, maybe we can talk, give it to Ashish. Why, why should we vote? Yeah, great, great, great reason here. We'll go around, talk about wh why it's important to vote to individually. But real quickly, like my thing was baseline, right? Like the easiest, quickest thing you can do is just throw it out on Instagram, right? But like, like Shahan, I, I know Shahan's been like hands on the past few months uh, and he has some cool things on, on Facebook. So you can hit up, hit him up there. And like, first of all, just ask people questions, right? Like people have questions. You don't seem dumb. Some things are really confusing at times, and especially during this period where there's this COVID, you're, you're a little scared about voting, the, the mailing thing's questionable, right, with the USPS thing going on. I mean, just ask someone, get some clarification, and I, I think it'll just be so much easier. All right, so you're asking me why it's so important to vote. So, I mean, I'll just give one or two reasons. I don't jack up all the reasons, but, I mean, when, when you first think about it, like, you're paying taxes, first of all, right? Where is that tax money going? Do you know? Right. Like, or are you just seeing this number subtracted from your paycheck? Right. Like you need to know where that money's going. And secondly, this is just like a birthright. Right. Like when you turn 18, you're like, what, what's exciting at 18? You're graduating high school and now you can vote. Right. Like you need to get your voice uh, out there. Right. Like this is your chance where you 
you're not only being vocal, you're actually taking action, right? Like you can do volunteering for candidates that you like, right? You can, you know, uh, share, you know, things that are going on and whatnot. But this is just like a basic birthright, right? And and if you're not voting, you're giving that up. And I, I don't see why not, right? Like like Sean mentioned, maybe there's not a candidate that you love, right? But there's definitely probably one that's better than the other, right? Someone that lines similar, at least, to, to something you're going towards. And uh, I think you just can't give that up. And, and this is the time to, like, stand up for issues you want to be heard. Like, when Sean's mentioning that there's so many candidates, not just the president, we're talking about, like, you know, state and local government, right? And that's where it all starts. Because, like I mentioned, when I first started, I thought it was just the president, right? Like, president does everything. That's all I'm voting for. You need to be knowledgeable about all the local and state government that's going on and who's running, what they're about, because that's where it starts. It starts from down here and then becomes, you know, state level, then federal. So just, you know, be aware about it. But that's that's where all starts is voting. So that's why it's so important to vote. Yeah, I really uh, I really love that you touched on uh, representation. Um, you know, someone even told me once that, like, if you don't get representation, you can dump tea in a river or uh, in the ocean. And, you know, I don't like seeing wasted tea. So, you know, I want to go out and vote. <laughs> yeah, we're all ending here. We, I mean, I mean, me and you are ending here. We're all brown wow. here. We, we like, we like, I'm sorry about that. We, we like, in, we like tea though. We don't need to be dumping tea for no reason, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, here, I'll throw it back to you, Deb. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have better tea. So yeah, I mean, I trust me. I understand even better than you guys. <laughs> you haven't had, you haven't had chai. That's a real tea. Yeah. So I think uh, one of the one of the biggest reasons for me personally of why I'm so excited to vote and why I want other people to vote is that non-voters make up the largest political group, quote unquote, in America. Like more, like more than Republicans, more than Democrats is non-voters. And I don't want to be one of them. I want to be a voter. And I think that like all of us can work to to make that not the largest political group. Because that's a that's a pretty shitty group. Going uh, going off well, uh, going off both of what Deb and she said, I think first of all, this is a right that we're given, an opportunity that we're given to have our voices heard. We fought for this right a long time, so I think it should be utilized. And like Deb said, I was reading uh, earlier that the at least the past two elections, the voting has been so close that let's say an extra hundred thousand of us or or not have voted, it could have changed the outcome of, of the election. So I think if, like I said, a lot of these non-voting individuals like myself start to vote, it could make a, a, a change. And that also, as Ashish alluded to when he was talking, there's a lot of different officials and options and from the local level all the way down to the national level. I'm sure there's one person or two people in there that has some type of policy there's something that excites you that you can get behind and you can support and even do things in your own community to even support that further if they do get elected. So I think there's a lot of potential to have your voice heard and to make a difference in this world. Right. And and you touched on something really quick I do want to talk about. Um, for years, growing up in Texas, I heard, like, I've used this excuse. I've heard it so many times. Why would I vote in Texas? It always goes Republican. Like, we just talked about how, look, there's a lot more than just the presidential election. Texas is a swing state this year. Every single poll indicates that Texas may go blue this year. Your vote in Texas matters. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I, I could literally do a, you know, an hour long monologue about this, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I almost have during this episode. But, uh, <laughs> but there's two things that I want to touch on, okay? So the first thing is, right? When this country was founded, uh, I, I think just to take it back to, to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? The idea of we meant white male landowners, right? That's all it meant. That's all it meant. Um, everybody who was in this chat would not have been eligible to vote now. Well, I don't know what they would have done with Ryan, but we wouldn't have been eligible to vote, right? And, you know, and then you talk about in, you know, 1865, they passed the 15th Amendment where it's technically legal to vote, but it's not protected in any way. In 1919, they make it legal for women to vote, right? This is this is the last, or sorry, 1920. This is 100 years ago. This is 100 years ago when women were not allowed to vote. There are people in this country that are older than 100 years old who are women who would have not been allowed to vote if, if uh, they had been around at the time. And 
then in 1965, obviously, we have the Voting Rights Act, which has been gutted, which is just a, a whole other monologue. But people have fought. People have died. People have been thrown in cages. People have been thrown in jail. People have been run over with cars. People have been shot just for our right to do this, right? Here's the deal. If voting didn't matter, if voting was a right that wasn't that important, then they wouldn't fight so hard to try to prevent us from doing it. And I, I look at this election in the year 2020, and I look at, for example, I mean, I, I look at so many of the candidates that are running who are, you know, minorities and women and people who are young people, you know, it's just, we're starting to move in a direction to change this country in, in, for the better, you know, and, and I think that the best thing that we can all do is we can get out there, we can vote, and look, you mentioned it, right? I, I, it's funny, right? I have a, I have a Beto for Senate uh, pin over here, right? And it's easy to say, well, that was a failure. We lost. You know, Beto lost. The candidate that I wanted to win the Senate lost. But what people don't remember well enough is that in the state of Texas, the, you know, ruby red forever state of Texas, we flipped four congressional seats. We, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but we made a huge dent in the Texas State House and the Texas Senate. Uh, and on top of that, now it's the year 2020, the state of Texas now, you know, Texas 24, where a lot of us live, potentially could flip. Uh, Texas 32 did flip. Texas 23 flipped. Texas 3 could flip. Texas 2 could flip. And these might just be numbers, but these are votes that when they go to Congress, it's going to change what the conversation is. And I just think that we have such a big opportunity here. And And again, I will make it about my personal political beliefs at this moment, right? From the year 2016, we saw Bernie Sanders twice run failed campaigns, right? We saw other candidates who are progressive run failed campaigns. But even though those campaigns failed, and, and look, I mean, I, I'm not like out of this group the biggest Bernie fan, right? But like what we saw is that it shifted the entire conversation, even in loss. So now Joe Biden running for president is one of the more progressive candidates that we've ever had. You know, the congressional reps that we have are some of the more progressive that we've ever had. It's not enough. It, you know, we still have work to do. But even if you lose the election, just letting your voice be heard changes everything. And so, look, we have one opportunity every two years to, to vote for national office. We have one every four years to vote for the presidency. This is our opportunity now. And if we don't take advantage of it, we are spitting in the face of all the people who came before us. Yep. Well, that that's definitely a great point, Shahan. A lot of good points in this episode from you. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, when, when we're talking about like standing up for your rights, it's it's great to talk about it. But like, this is the time we, we put it into action, right? And like Sean mentioned, this starts at the primaries, right? Like where we choose the candidate. Like if we come down here, this is like the final countdown. We have to choose one of these because this is what happened, right? Like the steps before this where we can be educated beforehand and, and, you know, do our volunteering, do whatever we can and choose who we want. Because like Shahan's touched on in, in these episodes and, and, you know, personal conversations, it starts at the local government level, right? Like all these things are in our hands. We're the ones who get to vote. So like giving that up just doesn't make any sense to me, right? Like you want your voice heard. You can make a difference. Uh, so please register and please go vote. Did you have yeah. something, Ryan? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Shahan for all the information and have the nice monologues and just the information you taught us today. So thank you, Shohan, <laughs> for taking this time out of your day to help educate educate all of America. And Th so thanks, uh, Ryan, for your very pointed questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, and one thing that I'll say right to right, all four of us on on this uh, program are South Asians. I'm sure a lot of the people listening are South Asians. Uh, one thing that I want to note, right? We're not just talking about, like, conceptually, South Asians could swing elections. Again, we live in Texas 24. South Asians make up 13% of the population here. If that changes from 2018 to 2020, that can swing the election. One of the districts that has gone from being nothing to all of a sudden surprisingly competitive is Texas 3. You know what district that is? Plano. Plano has been a plus 10 Republican district for basically our entire lifetimes. The polling's down to one point right now in Plano. That's insane. Like, this has never happened before. You want to talk about, uh, Ryan, I believe is Texas 31, I believe is what it is. There's actually a South Asian lady, Donna Imam, who's running there. 
So we're not talking about the idea of South Asians impacting elections. This is a moment for them to actually go out and do it. And look, I mean, we have been relatively invisible the last however long this country has existed, right? The last nearly 250 years uh, in elections. If South Asians go and if they flip these districts and if they play a part in turning the state potentially blue, that changes everything for us. So this is such a big opportunity, not just for us to potentially win some elections, but for South Asians in general to find their political voice. And it expands more than just us, right? Like this is for future generations. Like you might think, oh, it's only four years. No, like laws are passed, things that happen they can affect the rest of history, right? So, like, it's your time to make history, right? So, please, just check and make sure you're registered, your family, your friends, do your part, and and let's let's make things happen. And uh, I think that about just wraps it up. Is I, I thought we were going for a short episode. This one, you know, good in length. But, you know, if you have any questions, please just ask, right? It's a pretty simple process, but it gets, it gets confusing just for anyone. So, you know, we'll just, you know, send you to Shahan because he is obviously the most educated out of us here in that department. But for sure, just hit us up or hit anyone up and, and just be educated about this and, and let's let's make it happen. With that said, thank you so much for listening. We hope you got some great stuff out of this. And uh, until next time, see ya.